Is Jesus Christ your living hope? Has the cross spoken, spoken its word over your life? For do you know that Jesus Christ is the eternal Son of God? God from God, light from light, true God, of true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. And he took on flesh, became human by the Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit. And he did so for us and our salvation. He lived for your righteousness and he died paying the penalty for your sins. Such that any who believes in him, who trusts in his name, receiving him as Savior and Lord, could have the right to be called children of God. Not by nature, but by the Father's loving adoption. Is that your hope? The hope that Christ has purchased your salvation, that he is reigning now as the King of kings and will come again to judge the living and the dead. Is that your hope? For if that's not your hope, you're spending your life focusing on things that will pass away. God has made it so that we could live and focus on that which is eternal. And that's a little bit where we, we kind of left off last week. We're going to continue in our series in Nehemiah, part two of the message that I could not finish um, last week. And honestly, I could like break today's up into two as well. But I don't get to do that because Randy's going to be back next week. <laughs> and, and so I'm going to finish. But we talked about last week. We've been talking about how they were, there was this prayer that recounted the covenant faithfulness of God and the people's unfaithfulness. And how they were putting their hope, not in the Mosaic covenant, but in the God who keeps covenant, who had prophesied and told of a new covenant that was coming. A new covenant that was fulfilled and accomplished and secured by Jesus Christ in the gospel declaration that I just talked to you about. And the people in that faith, they moved to action as faith always does. Faith never lies dormant, but it receives Christ as as Savior and Lord and then begins to walk in light of the truth that Jesus is Lord, that he is King. And they committed to the Lord in a provisional but firm covenant in which they wanted to respond to what the Spirit had done in their midst by living transformed. And we talked about how the Spirit transformed us and gave us hearts that were committed to holiness and how the Spirit would, would captivate us with the beauty of Christ He would reform our beliefs, renewing our minds, and that he would strengthen our wills weakened by the flesh, and that we need to be careful to avoid the lies of legalism and lawlessness, but that we still needed to be committed to holiness, that God's grace and holy living are friends, not enemies. And that brings us to today. We're going to be looking at uh, pretty much at 1031 or 1030 as we're going to We're going to talk about this for for a good bit of time. Because after entering into this covenant with the Lord, the first specific commitment that was made by the people had to do with protecting the sanctity of the household. And this is important. This is one of of the the key points I want us to walk away with. I think it's actually the only point that I have bolded in in the handout. I'm not sure. Taylor told me to not bold some things and bold some other things, so I, I don't remember exactly what I did. And so... The point is this, that the Spirit works through godly communities, I mean, godly households, connected to the broader community of faith to build up the next generation. You see, this generation that we're reading about in Nehemiah, they had experienced the Spirit's work of revival, and they wanted that to continue in the next generation. And, this, and what we're seeing here is that the Spirit works through godly households connected to the community of faith to build up the next generation. Now, I just want to take a moment before I continue in this to address the unmarried in the room. Now, some of you are unmarried because by your choice, some by divorce, either a lawful divorce or maybe even an unlawful one, and some are widowed. I just want to speak a few words to those who are unmarried in the room right now. One, singleness does not render you a second-class citizen in the kingdom of God. Two, you do not need marriage or kids, to flourish in this life or ministry. Jesus didn't marry or have kids. Paul and many people throughout church history, such as Augustine. Now, Augustine 
is a different story because he had a kid out of wedlock before he became a Christian, but he never married. And there's many such examples I could point to. You do not need marriage to flourish in this life or ministry. And then third, regardless of what God has in store for your future, leverage your singleness in this time for the kingdom and glory of God. Because in a sense, through your undivided devotion to the kingdom of God, if you're single in this room, you are providing a unique preview of what heaven will be like for all of God's people. So singleness uniquely reflects our life in God's kingdom as being wholeheartedly devoted to Christ as a part of his family. Jesus says we won't be given in marriage in the new heavens and the new earth. It will be a different reality. We will collectively be the bride of Christ. And in this, singleness reflects the kingdom, and it helps us see that the family also reflects the kingdom of God. John 1 talks to us of us as being children of God. Ephesians 5 talks of us as being the bride. Matthew 12 says we're brothers and sisters of Christ, who is the firstborn. It's Colossians 1 and Ephesians 6, we, we are to honor our heavenly Father, reflecting his character. The 20th century theologian Herman Bavink said it this way. I think it's a good quote. He says, The family will correspond to its design to the extent that it constitutes a kingdom of God in miniature. For the kingdom of God does not exist for the sake of the family, but as is true of everything else, the family exists for the sake of the kingdom of God. The husband is the image and glory of God, the head and priest of the family, as Christ is the head of the church. And what he means there is, is that the father and husband is the spiritual leader of the household, not some kind of like mediator that stands between someone and God. That's not true. But we, we all have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. But in the household, husbands are designed, or by God's design, to be the head and spiritual leader of their household. God gives us, going back to the quote, God gives us children so that we may form them into children of God. The relationships of family life have their reflection and standard in that communal life of a much higher order found in the kingdom of God, end quote. In other words, families point to something greater than the family itself, and that is the kingdom. And the kingdom of God takes precedence over the natural family. And this is why as families we cannot, we can't, we must not isolate ourselves from the broader community of God's people. For godly households that are connected to the broadly, the Godly households that are connected to the broader community of faith, that is, for us, the local church, they are one of the chief means through which the Spirit transmits the gospel from one generation to the next. These families in Nehemiah that we're reading about, they were not isolated, but they were fully plugged in to the broader community of faith. So as I mentioned, it is no surprise for those who wanted to see the Spirit work in the next generation, it is no surprise that then the first specific commitment made by the people had to do with protecting the sanctity of the household. And that first commitment is this. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land or take daughters for our sons. Now, I'm going to build a whole sermon based on that vo verse, if you can believe it. Because this charge not to intermarry with surrounding peoples let me say this, because particularly in our region, from about, I don't know, the, the 1700s to the 1860s and even to the 1960s, and all, even, maybe even some today, the charge not to intermarry with surrounding peoples had nothing to do with the pigment of their skin. Had nothing to do with them being of a different nation or a different race. It had nothing to do... With racial concerns, the concern was religious. Because the surrounding peoples worshipped idols. In fact, even back if we see, there were actually some people in that congregation who had left those peoples and had joined themselves to the people of God through the necessary uh, steps that they had to take. It wasn't a racial concern, it was religious. Because to intermarry with the surrounding peoples would compromise the faith environment of the home. We see that time and time and time again. 
in Israel's history up to this point. And it's why Paul says basically the same thing in 2 Corinthians 6, where he's speaking broader than marriage, but it also applies to marriage when he says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? You see, the people in that time, they knew from their own history that the, the enemy was going to target the home. And they wanted to make sure they got that right. So now I want to speak to the unmarried in the room who desire to marry. Maybe you're a student in middle school or high school. Maybe you're a young adult. Maybe you're in the workforce or maybe you're in college. I want to speak specifically to you. And I want to give you a few charges to aid you in getting this right from the start. And the first one is this. Pursue purity. Pursue purity. Oftentimes the Israelites lust would lead them to intermarry with the women or men who worshipped idols. In other words, they sought to gratify the passions of the flesh rather than exercising the self-control that preserved the health of their soul. Like Esau, who sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, they were foolish and short-sighted. Young men, I want to specifically talk to you right now. If you're single and you desire to marry... Treat the young women in your life with dignity and respect. If you are pressuring them to commit sexual sin or asking them to send you inappropriate pictures, grow up. You're acting like a boy. Grow up as a man in Christ and stop doing such foolish things. Repent of your lust. Stop watching pornography and walk in the light of God's holiness. If you desire to marry as a young man or a young woman, or anyone who desires to marry, you should learn from the mistakes of the Israelites and pursue purity in your life. Hooking up with others in your 20s and watching pornography will not satisfy you, but leave you empty and full of regrets. Pursue purity. And this is true of people who want to remarry. It's like people think that purity is only for high school students and, and those in their 20s. No, if, you've, if, if you're remarrying and you're in that kind of scene down the road, pursue purity even then. Christ desires the better path for you. Now I want to speak a word of, com of comfort. If you, whether you're a man or a woman, single or married, have already faltered in this manner, the Lord's grace is sufficient for you. He redeems and he restores you to the path of purity. Don't let the regrets of your past keep you from the joy of walking in God's wisdom both now and in the future. Satan is going to try to say, you've lost purity altogether. There's no reason to try to pursue it. Christ says, no, no, no. I can redeem you. I can restore you. And you can walk again on the path of purity. The Lord is ready and eager to lead you in this pursuit of holy living. The second thing, if you're single and you want to marry, pursue commitment. I mean, pursue contentment. Commitment's a good thing to pursue too, but that's, that's not what I'm talking about. Pursue contentment. <laughs> Marriage is a good gift from the Lord. But the enemy loves to take the Lord's good gifts and turn them into idols. If you desire to marry, learn to be content in your current circumstances. It's okay to, de to desire marriage. I did. But, to, but desire it from a place of security in one's current state. Because marriage is great, but it ain't God. It's not going to fix all your problems. Taylor's great. She ain't going to fix all my problems. And I, I for sure ain't going to fix all hers. So, I mean, we, we're, we are both. Uh, that, that sounded worse than it was. It meant to make it worse on me. That joke is on me, not on Taylor. So, anyways. There we go. We'll talk it over at El Tap later. If you, 
if you fail to learn contentment in singleness, you're going to struggle with it in marriage too. Learning contentment in singleness will form you into the kingdom-minded Christian who flourishes in whatever life God has for you, whether it's single or married. Now, young women, I want to specifically speak to you. I'm going to be a little bit less harsh than I was with young men. I want you to know that your worth does not come from your appearance, your personality, or your relationship status. Your worth comes from the Lord who reigns over all his creation. So I plead with you, save yourself from the exhaustion of seeking your value in the fickle approval of man. The Lord of hosts is enough. Pursue commitment. And then third, pursue someone who encourages you in the faith and brings you joy. Look for people you like who love Jesus and walking in his ways. We don't have to fret too much about it. As you're pursuing the Lord... If if God's will for you is marriage, he'll likely bring someone alongside you who's pursuing the Lord just as eagerly as you are. It's what God did with Taylor and and I. We we met each other at a Christian camp. Many times people meet each other in the church. These these are good things to do. Don't operate with the world's wisdom, but operate with the Lord's wisdom. Listen to the wisdom of your parents. Be self-controlled. And embody the courage needed to pursue and invest in a relationship with someone. Young men, be courageous. When it comes time for you to pursue marriage, go up and ask the girl on a date. Be courageous. It's going to work because a relationship worth having does require courage. And if it's the Lord's calling for your life, it will be worth it. Now, for those who do marry, since the impetus behind God's charge not to intermarry with the surrounding peoples was to preserve the faith environment of the home, it would be an absolute shame if we just produced homes given to idolatry anyway. As a household, whether you have kids or not, even though I'm going to speak specifically to those who probably have kids, we ought to cultivate a home environment that promotes true worship i got seven things I want to say to this. Five from other passages of Scripture, two from the rest of Nehemiah. Ten. And the first one is this. Parent with the end in mind. God in his parental love for us, he sanctifies us in this way by the Spirit. Because as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3, that we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Ultimately, everything God decrees for our lives and his infinite wisdom is moving us to the same exact end, and that is to be conformed into the glorious image of Jesus Christ. And we ought to parent with a similar intentionality and wisdom. For in our parent, we are forming our kids into some image. Inevitably, because of the state in which we live and because of the fact that we're all sinners too, This image will reflect Christ and the world to varying degrees. And our goal is that they reflect Christ more than the world. Proverbs 22.6 is a general proverb that says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. This ought to be an encouragement to us and a warning. Those who parent with godliness as their goal generally raise godly children. Not always, but generally. And those who parent based on the values of the world, generally, they raise worldly children. And come 16, 17, 18, they're coming to Matt asking him to fix their children. But they've already set them on their path. Not that the Lord can't change them. He can. But be warned. So one of the most important questions, parents, that you need to answer is this. What sort of person do I want my child to become? Spoiler alert, the answer should be something like, I want my child to be someone in their, who in their unique calling and identity loves God and others well as they make Christ known. Clarity on this requires you to know your child well, to know God's wisdom, and to be firmly committed to God's mission. And then once you're clear to the answer to that question, you begin to parent your, your, uh, 
you begin to filter your parenting decisions through your answer. Does allowing my child to participate in this lead to the goal of them being godly reflections of Christ? Of allowing them to have this device or this social media platform at this age or be on this team or be in this show or whatever it may be, filter your parenting decisions through the answer to the question, what sort of person do I want my child to become? Look above the urgent Don't settle for the easy and parent according to the wisdom of God with the end end in mind. And then to shepherd the heart in love and patience. This is one of the key things that Randy told me, I don't know, four or five years ago when I asked him for, you know, what would you say the biggest advice for parenting would be? And this is what he said. And this approach to parenting will stretch you in many ways. For not only will you be walking with your children through their sinfulness, but you will also be confronted with your sinfulness along the way. In this pursuit, let me, let me just tell you, because all of these, like, I am learning from and, like, fall desperately short of. You will be presented with a temptation to merely modify behavior and achieve short-term wins through anger. Resist this temptation because there are a lot of well-mannered people going straight to hell. And the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So as Colossians 3 says, don't exasperate your child. Patiently and lovingly shepherd their hearts as you bring them up in the instruction of the Lord. Fathers, especially you, show love to your children. Hug them. Kiss them. Tell them that you love them and that you're proud of them and proud to be their dad. Show them patience and love. They need to see that from you and feel that from you. And then third, keep the conversation open. Talk with your children about the Bible and answer their questions. Just before entering the promised land, Moses gave the people, uh, instructed the people in a common confession and how it was to be transmitted to the next generation. He said this in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. In other words... Keep the conversation open. Talk to them as you go about life about God's word. You see, God expects Christian parents to talk to their children about his word. This means that parents, we need to be one. I mean, we need to be intentional to one, actually talk about our faith. And then two, keep the conversation open so that they feel comfortable talking to us about their doubts, their concerns, their struggles, and questions. Be warned, if you are consistently too busy or grow frustrated or shut down hard conversations, you'll lose the opportunity to invest God's word into your children. And then three, answer their questions. Now this can be tough. So at our house, we just watched The Prince of Egypt. I don't know if the last time you've seen The Prince of Egypt is about Moses in the Exodus story. But then you get to this whole point where, like, Pharaoh Pharaoh kills all these babies. And I'm having to explain that to my kids. And then then you get to the point where the angel of death comes in. And I'm having to explain that to my kids. And they're terrified of Pharaoh. So if anyone anyone of my kids asks you, is Pharaoh still alive? The answer is no. (laughs) He is not. And Egypt doesn't even have Pharaoh anymore. If you don't know world politics, they have a president. So there's not even a Pharaoh in Egypt anymore. He's a president. So no Pharaoh exists on this earth. They ask questions that are hard. Durant asked me one time, Daddy, does everyone love Jesus? I said, no, fortunately. Does that mean they go to hell? Yeah. Mason asked me, Dad, is God taller than me? I said, I said, well, God doesn't really have a body. He's, he's spirit. 
He goes, well, Jesus has a body. Well, I said, well, okay, well, Jesus has a body because he's also fully human. And then I'm like having to explain the details of the incarnation. And, and he goes, so what's the father? What's, what's the father's name? I said, well, it's just, you know, God or the father. And I said, well, Jesus is God and the father is God. I don't know, this don't make sense to me. I said, well, you know, like, I get it too, buddy. <laughs> so then I'm trying to explain the Trinity to him and it's, it's a deal. So answering these questions can be tough. And you may be tempted just to throw your hands up and not answer them. But don't be lazy. Read good theology books that teach you how to answer these questions well. The women went through a study. You are a theologian. You are one. You may not be a good one, but you are one. Hopefully, you are a good one. And I've been deeply encouraged by the, just the love for the knowledge of God that I've seen in this church, from our youngest to our oldest. So answer these questions, and that may require you reading some books, reading the scriptures more thoroughly, first and foremost, and then relying on your pastors. Maybe Matt can point you to a good resource that deals specifically with some of the questions you're getting, or Chad, or myself, or Randy, Mike. Don't be lazy. Don't shut those conversations down, but keep them open and then answer the questions. And then fourth, pray for and with your children. Because ultimately, the goal of Christian parents, the goal at least that we should have in mind, cannot be accomplished by natural means. We need the Holy Spirit to work miraculously in the hearts of our children, regenerating them unto eternal life and providing the gift of faith. You cannot do that. You cannot give your children eternal life, but you can point them to the one who can, and you can ask him to do so. Hear David's prayer for Solomon. He says, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts to you. He says, Grant Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. We need to pray such prayers for our children, by ourselves and with them. Our kids need to hear us pray for their salvation. They need to hear us pray for their purity. They need to hear us pray for their wisdom. They need to hear us give thanks to God on account of them to pray for the matters that are important to them, and to ask God for forgiveness for our shortcomings in parenting. We need to do that by ourselves and where they hear us do that. So find ways for this to happen. And then fifth, openly put the idols of your past away. Joshua 24 is a, a very popular passage that just speaks of this. And we may not always be aware of the idols that we worship, but idols, idolatry is the, is the sin from which all other sins flow. And we often have to put away the idols that our sinful flesh clings to. These could be idols that we inherited from our parents, idols we picked up in the past of our own living, or idols that we are currently being tempted with in the culture. Regardless of the source of the idolatry, the response is the same. Put them away by the Spirit's power. Now, hear me say this. You can hide the idolatry of your flesh from me, from Randy, from your life group leader, from a lot of people in this church or others in the community, but your family sees. Your family knows the idols you struggle with. So I think it's important to openly put those idols away, to often confess your sins to your family. Ask your children for forgiveness. Talk about the false appeal, appeal of the idol in question and then just talk specifically about the idols that you've seen in your life and how they fail to satisfy and how that what Christ offers is far superior. And then six, make corporate worship a priority. This brings us back to Nehemiah chapter 10. Verse 31, it says, And if, if the peoples of the land bringing goods any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, 
we will not buy for them on the Sabbath or on a holy day. Now, there's a lot there I could talk about, the Old Testament Sabbath and the biblical theology, how it rooted in creation, how it's taken up, fulfilled in Christ. And, and we, we live in many ways in light of that fulfillment. But here's what I'm just going to say, just a paragraph. The Old Testament Sabbath applies a principle of creation, six days of work, one day of rest, in its unique old covenantal context that is taken up and fulfilled in Christ. Who, Jesus being this, Jesus is our perpetual Sabbath, in whom we have rest continually, and who secured for us the eternal Sabbath rest that is the new heavens and the new earth. Nevertheless, in this life, we submit to the same creational principle in a distinctly new covenant context through our Lord's Day worship, how we gather to worship, and as we rest from our worldly concerns and celebrate what has been accomplished by Christ. I'll get many, many of this room or who work in the hospitals and they have works of necessity and they have different things that they need to do on this day just because of life. I get that. But I want us to keep in mind this, that our practices regarding corporate worship on the Lord's Day proclaim to our household the God or the gods we worship. I love baseball. I love the way a baseball looks. I love the way it feels in my hand. In fact, this is the baseball that I have in my car, and I just sometimes drive, and I don't know if this is safe or not, but I'm driving with one hand on, and I'm fiddling a baseball in my other hand. <laughs> Football is probably my, my greatest love when it comes to sports, but baseball was my first love. I remember playing t-ball. It wasn't any good. But I remember watching the Braves on TBS, and just watching them win, this, win the division and then losing the NLDS um, many times. And so I was very excited when they won the World Series. I love that Mason is playing baseball right now. I'm proud of him when he plays. And he makes a good stop. He caught a ball in the air, that pitcher, this, this, for his first game. He stopped a, a pretty hard ball with his throat, which I was proud of. <laughs> I was yelling at him to pick up the ball and tag first because he was at first base this time. <laughs> he didn't, but I was still proud of him. I hugged him. He was, he was upset. Few things are as aesthetically pleasing as the baseball diamond and the grass. I love baseball. Can I tell you something else about baseball? It makes a crappy God. It makes a horrific God. And you could be trying to disciple your kids to love the Lord. But if you consistently miss Lord's Day worship for travel ball tournaments, you know what they hear from you? Baseball is God. Take out baseball. Put in something else. Your work. Some other sport. Some other extracurricular activity. Or just a few extra hours of sleep. Your corporate worship practices on the Lord's Day proclaims to your household the God or the gods that you worship. Taylor caught that. It was good. And Chad is relieved because I told him I was going to throw it to him, but he didn't have to catch it. So make corporate worship a priority. It's worth it. It's what God expects of us. Why would we not want to rest together and celebrate the Lord together? It's what we're going to do for all of eternity. This is how we get to anticipate our eternal life with Christ. Why would we not make it a priority? You'd be like, Hunter, you're paid to be here. I, I am not here because I'm paid to be here. There's a lot of other things I could be doing to make a lot more money. I am here because I love the Lord and I love you guys. And I want to rest together with you. And I want to worship Christ together with you. Randy's the same. Any one of our pastors are, are the same. Make corporate worship a priority. And then seventh, model a living faith and a cheerful generosity. 
just going to read the rest of 31 and 32, which continues into a lot of other ways they give and through the rest of the chapter. It says, And we will forgo the crops of the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God. And basically what that's saying is we have an obligation to give a certain amount of money so that the worship in God's house could continue. And it goes on and talks about all the different ways that they're going to give. There's very intention, they're very intentional. They're, they're offerings that are going to help them live out the Levitical law uh, to a T. But they require the generosity of the people. And so in the time of the Old Covenant, God required, just so you know the kind of the context of what we're talking about here, God required that every seventh year that the land would have rest from being planted. So they would plant for six years, and then they would not plant anything in the seventh. And in fact, Israel never did that from the time of the giving of the law to the time of their exile. Whatever, whatever, year, whatever grew that year was supposed to be their food, and they would learn that they could rely on the Lord and that he would provide. And also the law stipulated that every debt would be forgiven in that seventh year. And this was God's protection for the poor in that economic system. And it tested the people's generosity. I'm sure they weren't the best at that either. And additionally, as, as I said in this, the rest of this chapter, is that people had various ways in which they supported the worship in God's temple. And this, I believe what Nehemiah is doing, what the people are doing, they're talking about the importance of families who were called to model a living faith in their God and a cheerful generosity that cared for the poor and sought to promote worship. So today, although the forms look different, the principle remains the same. Godly parents model their faith and their generosity for their children. Think about how you can model generosity for your children in a world of online giving, too. Let them know that you're giving. I know we pass the offering plate every time, and I know most of us give online. I do. But think about ways you can creatively model generosity for your children. Because in many ways, the character we desire our kids to have is more caught than it is taught. Do as I say, not as I do, should never be a sentence that crosses our lips. As we seek to cultivate a home environment that promotes true worship, we must model the living faith and cheerful generosity that befits one who has been redeemed by Christ. Now to bring this all to a close. One, I recognize many you be thinking this is this I don't have kids. You can still cultivate a, a, a household of true worship that pours into many spiritual children. Paul did this and others. I also recognize that some might be feeling a sense of shame. I do not preach this to shame anybody. 